Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the final day of the Pasco eSchool Virtual Great American Teach-In. My name is Jan Stern, and I am <clears throat> a teacher at Pasco eSchool, and we are here today with Steve Toe and some of his friends, uh, Kevin Power and Bill Williger. Uh, just a little bit of background about Steve and then from USF with a bachelor's degree in criminology, has spent more than 20 years in the federal law enforcement in multiple positions and agencies. And um, I am lucky enough to know Steve because he is uh, great friends with my husband. And um, so without further ado, um, I give you Steve, and one last thing, uh, if you would like to ask questions, please feel free to text me with your name at 813-330-0176, and text me your name and question, and I will get that asked for you. Thank you so much, and Steve, it is all yours. All right, good morning, everyone. This is uh, going to be interesting. This is my first one online. I've uh, done a bunch of teach-ins this week and in previous years, but this is my first one online. So uh, if I seem like I'm very absolutely ridiculous, you may know why. So uh, see behind me uh, in this kind of plaid shirt right behind me, that's Bill Williger. And on my other side here is Kevin Power. All three of us are special agents with the Department of Homeland Security. And then Homeland Security Investigations is our specific agency name. Um, so we're going to talk uh, on a bunch of different topics today. Uh, I'm going to kind of go through my background and Bill and Kevin will as well, um, just kind of how we got to our positions. Um, and then we'll kind of talk about our specialties. Um, so it should be interesting. Hopefully I don't bore you. Please ask lots of questions. Uh, this, the questions are the best part of, uh, of the teach-ins for sure. So uh, first of all, just my background, uh, like Ms. Stern said, uh, I grew up in the Tampa area, uh, went to high school here, and uh, went to college at USF, got a degree in criminology. Um, uh, after USF, I, I actually worked for the U.S. Customs Service back when it existed. Um, so if you know a little bit about the history, uh, I know most of you guys are uh, were born after 9-11, but uh, your 9-11 history is, is pretty important. So prior to 9-11, uh, there was lots of different agencies, uh, and there still are, um, but prior to 9-11, the, the two agencies that our agency is now made of, uh, it was the U.S. Customs Service on one side, U.S. Immigration Service on the other, and both had uniform divisions and both had investigative divisions. Now um, they've combined the investigative divisions into Homeland Security Investigations and the uniform divisions into Customs and Border Protection. So uh, I started actually as a customs inspector in 1997. Uh, prior to that, uh, I was a reserve deputy with Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. So I had a little bit of time uh, actually, you know, as a patrol officer uh, doing traffic stops or responding to calls for service. Um, during that time, I also went to uh, uh, just a short story. I went to my very first call as a deputy, and it was a person down call. And those calls are, are interesting because you don't know what, that's all you get. You're going to a person down call. So I showed up and I didn't know what to do. So um, I felt kind of helpless. Uh, here's this person laying on the ground and I didn't really know what to do. So um, after the paramedics got there, I kind of uh, made up my mind that I would learn a little bit more about it. So actually I went to EMT school then. So I got certified in 1997, I think, or six as an EMT. Um, so which helped out a lot uh, in my career and I'll, I'll kind of get into some of the other things uh, where it helped. So I was a customs inspector from 1997 to 2002. Uh, that includes, you know, through the September 11th attacks. Uh, in 2002, I had the opportunity to become a federal air marshal. So I was a federal air marshal for uh, six years. In those six years, I spent three years as a full-time trainer. So, uh, which is kind of a specialty within the fam service. All I did every day was teach. So, and I, I taught just about everything uh, from firearms to defensive tactics, 
um, also taught law, report writing, and medical, lots of different topics. So I spent three years flying and three years uh, actually training other air marshals to do the job. Um, after that, in 2008, I got hired as a special agent with Department of Homeland Security, where I am now. So I've been here for uh, just over eight years, uh, and we do a couple different things. So uh, this is the point where if we were in person, I would ask you guys a question, but since I, no one's going to answer, right, um, we'll talk about kind of what Department of Homeland Security does. So Homeland Security uh, encompasses a bunch of different uh a bunch of different agencies. Um, so to include our agency, Homeland Security Investigation, along with Customs and Border Protection. So when we talk about CBP, uh, those are the guys that you would see if you crossed an international border, whether it was by a cruise ship, uh, a land border, uh, you're flying internationally. So that's one part of Department of Homeland Security. Um, our division, the Homeland Security Investigations, um, we are responsible for investigations um, in a whole bunch of different uh, areas. So if you start with just uh, understanding homeland security, uh, we are responsible for certain terrorism violations. So uh, you always hear the FBI. Uh, they are definitely the, the premier agency, uh, and they promote themselves very well. Uh, <laughs> sorry, FBI guys. Uh, but uh, we also handle some of the, the same uh, statutes uh, and enforce the same laws uh, that they do on terrorism uh, to include uh, immigration. So uh, if you know anything about most of our uh, recent terror acts, uh, they were immigrants. So uh, we already had information on them, not derogatory information, or obviously the government would have been doing something more about it. Um, but so we handle some terrorism. Um, when you think about the borders, and Brandon, you mind if I ask you some questions since you're live? Yeah. All right. So when you think about borders, what kind of crimes do you think cross borders that we enforce? Um, type, drug type of crimes, bringing drugs over, or just bringing anyone who hasn't legally been able to come into the country, just Good. crossing illegally. Absolutely. So uh, Brandon hit on both of them, and so we do drugs and, and persons. So when we talk about persons, it's um, we don't investigate the people who have come over here illegally. We investigate the people that are smuggling them. So the ones that are taking them across the border and profiting from it, because it's often a very violent uh, crime to include extortion, um, uh, lots of different things are taking money, they're promising certain things. And then uh, we also do human trafficking. So human trafficking is really when someone is promised something here in the United States. Let's say, hey, we're going to bring you to the United States and have you work in this very nice uh, office building. Great. Well, then they are forced uh, into working in a sweatshop or substandard working conditions uh, against their will. And then they're, they're often uh, threatened or their families are threatened. And of course, they hold their passports and uh, take their money, do those things. So, and then Brandon also mentioned drugs. So uh, I was lucky enough to work on a task force uh, for the first five years here. And all we did was drug smuggling in the Caribbean. So, and really how that affects us is all of our interdictions were done outside the borders of the United States. However, all the drugs were destined for our country. And then part of international law allows us to uh, enforce the laws of the United States um, in international waters. So, but that also includes drug smuggling across physical borders. Uh, so the U.S.-Mexico border, vehicles come across carrying contraband. Hopefully CBP, so Customs and Border Protection, finds those drugs uh, and then seizes them. So we handle that. Um, we handle a bunch of other things. So we do uh, financial crimes. So whether it's uh, if you guys have heard of the, the scams from other countries where they say, hey, uh, send me $5,000 um, and I'm going to send you $15,000 back because I can't do this money transaction in my country or 
uh, things like that. So we investigate financial crimes to include money laundering. Uh, again, Brandon, I'm going to pick on you just because you're my easy target. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> what do you know about money laundering? Uh, I don't know much about money laundering, but it's using uh, two different, obviously, areas to gain a profit uh, through an, in an illegal way. I don't know much about it. Okay. No, that's good. So money laundering is um, basically uh, kind of exactly what it says. It's washing your, your money. It is concealing the origination of that money. Uh, so if you're selling drugs and lots of people are paying you cash um, for these drugs, you can't just put it in the bank and call it a day and then go out with your ATM card later and, and get money. Uh, you have to wash that money. And so we also investigate money laundering. And there's all kinds of different schemes on money laundering um, that uh, there are lots of books and lots of good resources on because uh, I'm definitely not the expert. But uh, again, one thing we we do. Um, we also do uh, fraud investigations, so which includes uh, counterfeit products. Uh, so anything from counterfeit DVDs or um, brand name things like a Coach purse um, or Nike shoes. Uh, we also investigate other fraudulent items uh, and that are very very dangerous. So when you think about prescription drugs, you're counting on the whatever you're taking as a prescription drug, that that is exactly what it is, uh, exactly what it's used for, and it's the right one. Um, there are substandard pharmaceuticals made in other countries, and they are brought in fraudulently as the real thing. And that can hurt people, obviously. Um, what other areas, guys, before I... So, tell the next one. All right, so... Kind of what uh, Kevin and I work on, and uh, Bill actually did some work on as well, uh, is child exploitation. So um, we, it's part of our, uh, our jurisdiction, and that jurisdiction is actually based on the computers. So um, when you look at the Interstate Commerce Clause, which is uh, a, a law that goes way back that gives agencies jurisdiction, it's basically when uh, any commerce... Uh, goes across state lines or international lines, that's kind of where we get uh, the authority. So uh, the child exploitation crimes we deal with are um, much of it is the, the trading and um, production of child pornography. Um, we also deal with uh, sex tourism where people travel to have sex with uh, underage people, which obviously is illegal. Um, and then we also do, uh, do some other things uh, to help protect, you know, the young ones. So we're going to talk a little more about, uh, internet safety, maybe a little bit later on. Um, so, uh, one thing I'll get into briefly is, um, one of the things I'm fortunate enough to, to be a part of, Kevin was a part, Bill's a part of it now, uh, is our special response team. So our special response team is as much like any other SWAT team. Uh, we are, uh, you know, a group of essentially specially trained police officers, um, and eight were agents, um, and we go after the worst of the worst. We do the highest risk search warrants and go after the 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 biggest bad guys, so to speak. Um, so we get lots of special training and lots of special equipment. So I've got some of that equipment. Um, and I'll go over that in a second, but um, my job on the team is I am the, uh, the medic. Uh, so I'm sure most of you understand what a medic is, but we'll kind of go over it is uh, I am a EMT, uh, not a paramedic, but I am an EMT, which is kind of the lower level. And that's what I talked about. I went to school back in the, in the late 90s um, for EMT, and I've been back to all the recurrent training and things like that. So I use that training to help keep the guys on my team safe. Okay, so safe from not only injuries, but also things like dehydration. So we're out wearing lots of hot, heavy gear. Um, and Bill being one of the people that uh, is prone, prone to uh, heat problems and sweating problems. Um, so, but uh, we're, as a medic, I'm responsible for my team. 
So um, the way I, I actually, they call it essentially practicing medicine um, as an EMT, uh, we can only do that in certain situations. And the reason why we do it is uh, those situations are law enforcement situations. So when you think about it, uh, if we were on a search warrant and someone got hurt, if you called 911 essentially or called for uh, firefighter paramedics, they wouldn't come in because that's not what they specialize in. They, they don't want to deal with a volatile situation where they can get injured. Um, so that's my job. So my job is to um, kind of uh, treat them at least initially and then uh, get them to more definitive care, whether that be a paramedic or a hospital. So um, the, the trick question of the day, and again, Brandon, I, I hate to keep picking on you, but you're, you're, my, you're my target. So we obviously talked about uh, good guys on my team. Uh, and then we, we could talk about good guys, so uh, random citizens. Obviously, I'm going to provide care for them as well. The trick question is, do I provide care to injured bad guys? I wouldn't think so, that you would provide care to them. So <laughs> that's why it's a trick question. Um, so the answer is yes. And we have a responsibility, not only as law enforcement officers, and me particularly as an EMT, I have a responsibility to treat everyone. It doesn't matter if this is the bad guy that just shot at me and I shot him back. I know that sounds weird, but uh, if a bad guy is injured, my responsibility is to treat him both as, excuse me, a EMT, as a law enforcement officer, and also as a good person. Um, this is a, a little bit uh, strange to hear it with, uh, I know this age group, but uh, I did a lot of elementary school kids this year uh, for the teach-in, and we talk about bad guys. That's like our our general term. A lot of us use bad guys as a uh, as a term, but when we really think about it, there's a certain group of people that are bad people. There's no doubt about that. They are bad people, but there's also a certain group of people that have just made bad choices. So, and we don't want to you know broadly classify people as bad people. So. That's just my, my public service announcement for the day that, uh, you know, certainly as a law enforcement officer, um, you know, I don't, and all of my, my counterparts, we don't broadly classify people as bad. Um, you know, people make choices and there are obviously consequences for those choices. So kind of my public service announcement, uh, hopefully I didn't get too far on my soapbox. All right. So, um, just real quick on, on the medical side, give me just a second and grab uh, some gear. All right, and if you guys have already probably noticed, you see the three of us here in plain clothes. So if you saw the three of us sitting in the mall, you probably wouldn't think anything of us, just three guys. Yeah, well, one old guy and uh, two sort of old guys. Middle-aged. Don't want the gray hair for you. Yes. So uh, uh, we we work in plain clothes. Um, obviously, when we're doing enforcement operations, we are marked up. Um, so, and I'll show you the first piece of gear here is just a bulletproof vest. Everyone's seen these before. Um, mostly, uh, you see police officers every day wearing these. Mostly, they're under clothes. Um, this is one of our, our light vests. Um, this one only weighs about five or six pounds, um, and that one is designed to stop handgun rounds. All right, so Kevin's bringing up this one. Um, this is our heavy uh, armor. This is for our special response team, so this is generally what we wear. Um, it's a much heavier armor, not only in weight, but in thickness. So you have plates that go in here, um, and those plates are designed to stop rifle rounds. So it'll stop not only pistol, but also rifle rounds. Um, these typically weigh fully loaded. Kevin's is empty right now, um, or pretty close to empty. Uh, they usually weigh 30 to 35 pounds, so nice and heavy to, uh, to carry around on your shoulders. All right, so specifically on, on the medical side, um, this is my medic bag. Um, nothing super special about it, but uh, 
We've got my trauma shears. This is to, to actually cut off clothing uh, so we can actually see injuries and get right down to them. And then, of course, some of the stuff that everyone's seen a million times before but may not know someone in law enforcement would carry it. Um, so I've got a couple needles in here for doing some, some different techniques. Um, a stethoscope, blood pressure cuff, and then lots of things for bleeding control. Um, large bandages and gauze, um, and then uh, chest seals. If you have a wound to your chest, we use that seal. Um, and then obviously just a lot more uh, things to, to handle bleeding. Uh, Brandon, are you good? Any questions or questions from the field so far? No, I don't have any. All right. Um, I'm going to show you just a little bit more gear, and then I'm going to turn it over to Bill for a minute. All right, so on our SWAT team or our SRT team, um, we're part of our responsibility is to serve search warrants and actually make entry into bad guys' houses. Um, this is one of our tools. Uh, you see one end has a, a large pry head, and the other is you know, just a big sledgehammer. There's a shield. Ah, there we go. So Kevin's got our shield here. Uh, if you notice, it's got a light on the front and also a glass window. That glass window is bulletproof as well. Um, so the idea with the shield, obviously, is to protect our team. All right, moving on. Uh, this is our helmet. Um, you'll see it's got the ear protection built in. So that ear protection not only protects us uh, from loud noises, um, but also has our communications in it. I don't know if you can see it on the, the screen here, but that is the boom mic. So we have a microphone on there so we can talk to the rest of our team. Uh, and again, this helmet is also uh, bulletproof. All right, I see that we've lost sound. Brandon, can you still hear me? We can hear you. Steve, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you and I can hear Brandon. Can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me? Yep. Okay. Okay, keep going. All right. Since I interrupted, well, if anybody has any questions, please text your name and question to 813-330-0176, and I will be happy to get it on air. All right, so again, we've got more protective equipment. Um, and again, nothing, none of this is new, but you may be surprised at some of the things that we have. Um, so here's our gas mask. So the gas mask is to protect us, but the gas mask also protects bad guys or the, the people that we are attempting to arrest. So if they are in their house and not coming out and threatening to shoot us or shoot themselves, um, our job is to try and get them out safely. So, and to do that, we may fire tear gas into the house. So of course, we're gonna protect ourselves from the tear gas. And that tear gas actually, as much as it, uh, it may be painful, at least temporarily painful for them, it actually uh, helps them in the, in the long run. Uh, if they are irritated by the tear gas and actually come out and we don't have to fight them, uh, that's the best re you know, resolution there. Uh, all right, a couple more things. Uh, these are the tools that uh, we also use. Let me grab a couple things. All right. Still got me, guys? Yep, we still got gotcha. you. And I have a couple of questions for you from Angelique. Okay. She would like to know, has the vest ever stopped a bullet for you? Uh, that's a good question. I'm, just saying, I'm fortunate enough that I've never been shot, and I've never shot anyone. Great. That's a good thing. Um, and the other question from Angelique is, um, she's not sure if you said anything, but what has been the most difficult situation that you've been put in? Um, that is really hard. Um, let's think about that. 
You know, um, I look back at a time when I was a, uh, a deputy, um, and this is after I went to EMT school. Um, I went to a, a stabbing call. So I uh, went to this call, and it was at a, a country bar about 2.30 in the morning. Everyone was out in the parking lot. Uh, two guys decided to get in a fight, and one stabbed the other. Um, so I responded and uh, ended up saving his life. Uh, he had uh, a stab wound to his chest. He had a large slash wound across his forearm um, and was definitely on his way to, uh, to death. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get there fast enough to, to really do some positive uh, things as far as medical care. And that was probably... Um, probably the hardest mentally, and it wasn't right there at the time, it was afterwards. It was that uh, adrenaline dump that pushed me through uh, the actual event um, and relying on my training and experience. Um, but then afterwards, I was a wreck. Uh, I was an absolute wreck. I, um, I just felt like jelly. Um, and there's been other times I felt like jelly. Um, you know, you, after you have that huge adrenaline dump, and you're coming down, uh, very challenging situations for sure. Uh, but that's probably the most challenging. In fact, while we're on that question though, um, Kevin, Bill, you guys wanna address that? Yeah, that was a good question. And uh, Bill and I were both involved in something uh, years ago uh, where our SWAT team responded to uh, a shooting in St. Petersburg where two police officers with St. Pete Police Department were, were killed trying to arrest an individual and he was barricaded in the attic of their uh, this, this residence. And uh, Bill and I, as part of the SRT at the time, before Steve joined our, uh, our agency. Hey, Zach. You been there? Oh, okay, never mind. Oh, Zach. But uh, so we uh, we all had to respond. We, we used our big black armored vehicle. Uh, it's called an MRAP. Uh, and uh, we responded. Uh, and then by the time we got there, we, we, we uh, the situation was resolved, but it ended up in the, uh, the death of the two St. Pete police officers who were originally on the scene. And uh, there's nothing sadder or harder for us in law enforcement is going to uh, a funeral for another law enforcement officer uh, who's, who's, who's given his life and uh, in the performance of his job uh, protecting the public. So it's just a very difficult thing uh, to go through. So that's probably one of the hardest things we've ever uh, had to go through. Yeah, and uh, you know that one actually didn't come to mind because uh, I, I was there um, and about 50 feet from the house um, you know, it just absolutely, uh, awful day for us. Um, anyone who was there just, um, you, know, you, you can't really express how, uh, how it felt to, to be there. You see it on the news, um, and us as law enforcement officers, we relate to it, uh, you know, reading, um, or watching, watching the news. Um, but actually being there is, is pretty horrific. So, um, yeah, very difficult time, um, you know, for all of us. But all right, so um, uh, Ms. Stern, was there other questions yet or just those for now? Just those for now. We're doing great. All right. So, uh, again, we'll just kind of move through some of this equipment. What I've got here is a what everyone's seen before. It's a, an M4, uh, much like anything that uh, our military carries. Um, it's, uh, we have a, uh, this selector switch here is, uh, safe semi and burst. So it's a burst fire gun, but sometimes we call it safe semi and lots of fun. Uh, so this is one of the, the fun parts of my job. I get to carry around machine guns. Um, I'm also a firearms instructor, so, uh, I get to spend plenty of time behind this rifle and I've got another one here. Um, so this is a... H&K MP5, it's a submachine gun. Make sure I'm not pointing at Kevin. Uh, so in this one is the same thing. It is a uh, safe semi and three shot burst. Uh, this one shoots nine millimeter, the other one shoots uh, 223, a, a rifle round. So, and again, uh, part of the equipment we carry, um, we train for, uh, and I've fortunately never had to use uh, in the line of duty. Um, all right, so since this is e-school, We'll kind of talk a little bit about, sorry, I'm trying not to drop my <laughs> rifles here, um, a little bit about technology. Uh, so Kevin and I are both special agents. That is our primary job. We do investigations. But uh, we 
further specialize into computer forensics. So Kevin and I, uh, Kevin's been doing this for 18 years, my goodness. Uh, and Kevin is actually going to be retiring, uh, unfortunately, because he is a wealth of knowledge. Uh, so I've been doing forensics about two years. Um, and those forensics uh, picture anything electronic we can retrieve data off of. So cell phones, computers, laptops, you know, hard drives, uh, flash cards, cameras, GPSs. Um, our job is to take that data off of the device and then provide it to the, uh, the agents who are actually running the case. So as part of that, uh, did some pretty specialized training. We do uh, a six-week course. So that's Monday through Friday, you know, eight to five, long, hard days of learning computer forensics. Uh, and of course, before we even show up to the six-week class, we have to have what's called an A-plus certification, which is kind of an industry standard computer certification. So we have to be pretty experienced in computers before showing up to this course. And of course, it's a fairly selective process. Uh, so we do the six-week course, and then we come back out into the field and, and do these exams. And of course, we have lots of uh, recurrent training uh, to, to stay up with the latest technologies and techniques. Um, so, and again, since this is a e-school presentation, uh, I'm sure there is a certain segment of you guys out there who uh, are into technology. Uh, so right now, uh, I'm streaming from my government MacBook Pro, and it is a uh, essentially the top of the line MacBook Pro. Uh, it's got 16 gigs of RAM and one terabyte solid state drive. Um, so kind of fun. Uh, I've also got uh, a Surface Pro that's got 16 gigs of RAM, um, and then my uh, main forensic computer is a dual processor, uh, 64 gigs of RAM, and I have about 25 terabytes in total um, plugged in, whether it's internal hard drives, external docks, um, and then our network. So behind you, uh, you can actually see uh, our server kind of run in here. Um, so we've got a nice uh, server set up um, to include our network attack storage, uh, which is 66 terabytes online, along with a 60 terabyte tape drive. Um, we have another separate server that does one of our software programs is uh, very hardware intensive, so we have a uh, special server for it. That server is, again, a dual processor. It's got 192 gigs of RAM and 15 solid state drives in it. Uh, when it gets going, the lights in the building should dim. So it's, uh, it's a pretty amazing machine. Uh, so we're fortunate enough to have a lot of uh, really great equipment to, to do our jobs. Um, and again, most of our uh, computer forensics actually revolve around child exploitation. Um, and I know Kevin feels this way, and, and I'm, I feel very strong that this is the, one of the most important things that our agency does. Uh, this makes a positive impact on people's lives because uh, you know, there are live victims out there um, that you know, need saving. Uh, so that's part of our job. Everybody good so far? Questions? I have a feeling Angelique's going to be sending some more. All right. Uh, I'm going to send it over to Bill. I'm going to switch seats with him real quick and have him uh, talk about his specialties. Hey guys, I'm Bill. Um, I've been an agent for uh, 10 years. Um, and like Steve was saying, uh, you do have to go through a lot of specialized training. Um, and the selection process for our job is pretty intense. Um, the requirements to get the job, really all you need is a four-year degree. It doesn't matter what your degree is in. My degree was in elementary education. I taught fifth grade for four years, I think. So it doesn't matter what your degree is in as long as you have a four-year degree. That's the most important part. However, the selection process is, is pretty steep. Uh, a couple years ago, we had 6,000 applicants for our job, and they only hired about 800 people. And uh, our academy is about uh, 26, 27 weeks long up in Georgia. So it's, it's, a, it's pretty intensive once, um, once you get the job. And Steve's talked a lot about technology and um, 
a lot about different things, but the one thing that the most important uh, tool that we have in our job, believe it or not, is a paper and a pen. Um, we take copious notes on everything we do. And granted, the paper and pen's now being replaced by voice notes on everybody's iPhones, but- uh, I was gonna say, good old fashioned technology, paper and pen. Yep. <laughs> uh, but I mean, all of us carry around these little, um, little tiny memo books are about that big and everybody's jotting stuff in them. And uh, the reason that we take all these copious notes is because if you don't write it down, it didn't happen. You have to be able to substantiate what you've seen in the form of a report. And those reports are then turned into the search warrants and the arrest warrants that we use to do our job. So this paper pencil is the biggest part of our job. And those notes that we take turn into search warrants and arrest warrants that are somewhere between on the small side, they're 20 pages. And on the bigger side, they're upwards of 60 to 80 pages long. And it's, it sounds ridiculous, but it's the stuff that we learned in elementary school and that our kids are going through right now and you guys are going through right now where the punctuation, the capitalization, the correct sentence structure, I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, you can have all the details in the world in these reports, but if they're not, if the writing is garbage, they're gonna get handed right back to you. And all that work was pretty much for nothing. So, um, can't stress enough that if this job does interest you, think about um, the basic skills because you can be great at all these high level skills, but if you don't have the basic skills, you're never going to get it. And while we're on getting this job, I mean, you see three guys in front of you, women absolutely do this job. Um, we have a woman that's on our special response team and uh, the individual that's in the special agent in charge of our office, which covers almost the entire state of Florida is a woman. So don't think that this is a, uh, a male only job. Women do get into it as well. That's awesome. Um, I do have a question um, yes. and the question is from Stacy. Stacy would like to know what advice would you give to students who are interested in law enforcement careers and are there opportunities that they can participate in? <laughs> me, 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 me. <laughs> All right, so I'll kind of sneak up here, and Bill's got some more to talk about, too. But um, one thing I actually neglected to mention, and, and in fact is in my notes, is something called the Explore Program. And you have to forgive me, I just put a starburst in my mouth. Uh, but the Explore Program is actually part of the Boy Scouts, but it's open to men and women, uh, 14 to 21. So uh, I started as an Explorer when I was 14. Uh, I actually started the Explore Program as... Uh, not just law enforcement, they also have fire explorers and they have business explorers and medical explorers, computer explorers. And I don't know if all of those are still around, uh, like when I was in explorers, but they do exist. So uh, when you think about law enforcement explorers in the Tampa area, uh, Tampa Police, Hillsborough County, Pasco County, uh, and Customs and Border Protection all have explore programs. And the explore program is really designed to give you, uh, we'll call it a taste, uh, an insight into law enforcement and to see if that is the career that you'd like to pursue. So I started when I was 14 with a with the Customs Explorer program uh, and I had more opportunities than, than I could even start to list um, to include being hired while I was in college. Um, I worked as kind of like a, a clerk. <laughs> uh, I don't I did just about anything that needed to be done, whether it was copies or, uh, you know, helping out with uh, uh, agents on their cases. Um, so role playing. <laughs> role playing, I used to get beat up by the special response team. Shot out a lot. <laughs> um, so, and of course I learned my, my entire career was based on my time in Explorers. It's a fantastic program. Um, and to, to find out about it, all you have to do is contact the Boy Scouts locally and they'll tell you what programs are really out there. But like I said, all the, the law enforcement uh, agencies locally have uh, Explorer programs. Um, I traveled across the country competing. Uh, it was very fortunate. I went to four national competitions, I think six or so state competitions. Um, 
So, and you compete in all the, the law enforcement disciplines, whether it be traffic stop or uh, burglary in progress or um, shooting. Uh, so I got to compete in all those things and you know, fortunate enough to be part of a great team that we did a, a lot of great things. So that's, that's probably the best way to start uh, in law enforcement, especially at, at your current age. I was in ninth grade when I started, went all the way through just about college. Um, so very good opportunity to, uh, to start in law enforcement that way. And quite honestly, what you'll find is, you know, it may not be for you. Um, out of the, call it about 50 other, you know, kids my age at the time, there's probably only five or six of us in law enforcement. Everyone else went on to do different things um, and chalked it up as a good experience. So great question, Stacy. So thank you. I'll let Bill continue on his <laughs> his journey. Um, the other thing, uh, if you're interested in it, is as I said, you do need your four year degree, but military also helps. Um, right now, we're uh, a very veteran heavy uh, agency, um, so that in the hiring process, you get it's kind of like a, a ranking system, and if you have veterans preference or veteran service, you get more points. So that's something that you can also also to consider. Um, uh, my job, I've been in three different investigative groups in uh, 10 years. Um, my first investigative group I was only in for, I think, a year and a half, and I was in fraud. Um, and I did a lot of the immigration fraud and then um, a little bit on uh, – customs fraud, like fake purses and stuff like that. And then I was fortunate enough to get transferred to a new group. Um, and I wound up doing human trafficking and I did a lot of domestic human trafficking. So I, my focus was primarily on us citizens, both adults and juveniles that were being forced to commit commercial sex acts. Um, we rescued countless number of girls. Um, we didn't, we tried, but we were never successfully able to locate boys that were being trafficked. Um, they are out there, but we were just ne never able to find any. Um, and, and in doing this job, we did encounter a lot of uh, a lot of child pornography. So I know we've hit on that a couple times, but that's that's a, unfortunately it's a big part of our job, and it's um, a very exploitation-based driven uh, field. Um, but if there is a good side to it, it has afforded me the opportunity to travel the world. Um, I've been all over the United States. I've been to Asia. I've been to Africa. Uh, I've been to Europe. I've seen all the oceans of the world. So um, this job is more than what's inside these four walls. There, we have uh, offices in 57 countries, I think, if I'm, right. if I'm not mistaken. So you can go to all of these uh, – you can be stationed in these different countries, and it's a lot of fun. So you get to – experience a lot of different things. Um, and as Steve was saying earlier, I'm also on a special response team and I have a couple different jobs. My first job is as an assaulter, which I don't get to do that much, but my primary job is a sniper. And here's my gun. She's big and she's fat and she's ugly and heavy. Wow. And I love her. <laughs> um, and believe it or not, uh, Did you name her? Darlin. <laughs> <laughs> Um, believe it or not, this, uh, I didn't think, I didn't realize it when I started, when I foolishly raised my hand to be a sniper with Kevin the first time around. Um, this is an exceptionally math heavy discipline. I never would have thought it, but I use math to do this stuff more than I use anything else. Um, and just to give you a quick example of the math, the kind of math this is, um, we typically think of a circle as having 360 degrees. Well, there's another measurement for circles, and it's called milradians. And a milradian basically breaks a circle into a million different pieces. There's so you, the circle is bisected by a million different lines. And those million different lines, we call them mills for short, are, is the graduation that our scope is used. Let me get it. So 
This little uh, knob right here, I spin it around and it's graduated into 10 mils and then it's subdivided, each mil is subdivided into a tenth of a mil, it, as is this. So this is my elevation, this brings my crosshairs up and down and this brings my crosshairs left and right. So I have a bunch of different tools that I use. Um, I have a laser range finder that tells me how far the distance is to the target and I have another uh, little tool called the Kestrel, and the wind blows, and it, it gives me the, um, the temperature and how fast the wind's coming, going and from what direction. And I have to do a quick calculation, and it translates that information into mills, and that tells me the adjustments that I have to put on when shooting my rifle. And you wouldn't think that all this math would go into it, but it is a lot of math, and thank God for calculators because I – a lot of this stuff I <laughs> do in my head, um, but it's the tiny little things that that make a difference. Um, for example, if I'm shooting out at a hundred yards, I just I leave everything where it is. If I go into um, twenty five yards, I have to I have to twist this. I have to, it's called a, a mill or a click. I have to hear fifteen clicks. But then if I go out to 275 yards, I also have to go 15 clicks. So, it, and that has to do with the way the bullet, once the bullet leaves the barrel of a rifle, it actually, it doesn't go in a straight line. It actually drops down and then it shoots up in an arc, kind of like a parabola, a little more math. And the further out you go, the, the distance that the, the arc of the bullet changes. So, I mean, and I've shot this thing out to, and hit steel out at 1,200 yards, and it's all math, as crazy as that sounds. Um, and it, so not only do I have to do, oh, okay, questions. We'll take questions now. <laughs> <laughs> questions are always good. But you were talking, it was so interesting. Um, so Christopher would like to know, um, and he's not quite sure if you had said it or not, and he missed it, but how many people do they select in the training process typically? For, to be an agent, um, it really just depends on the applicants, and it, it goes in waves. So um, right now, we haven't hired anybody in a long time, and through attrition, we've had a lot of guys retire. Like, Kevin's going to be leaving here in the Soon. month. Yeah, he's... He's almost to the point where he's counting down hours, not days anymore, luckily for him. So um, we've lost a lot of people through attrition. We haven't hired. So we're about to go on a big hiring blitz. And some years they'll only put like one or two classes through, which is 24 to 48 people. In mm -hmm. other years, um, I think the, the, the year I went through, they put through like 3,000 of us. I mean, it, it was crazy. I mean, it was guys were just stacked up. So it, it, it goes in waves as far as the hiring process. But my, I, my application was in the system for almost four years from the time I put my application in by the time I went to the academy. And other people's had their, their um, academy selections in like six months, 18 months. So it just depends on when you apply. And did you go directly from being a teacher into this field? Or did you have something in between? Um, I did have something in between. I realized uh, I really wasn't making too much money as a teacher, so I took another job. Uh, but the um, the other job really it didn't do anything for me to get this job. I I actually applied for this job when I was a teacher, but the uh, the hiring process was so long I wasn't gonna I didn't want to wait around. Um, another question we have is: Have you ever shown up in traffic court because someone was fighting a ticket? Not sure that's really connected, but um, we, interestingly enough, we do have what's called peace app, peace officer status in the state of Florida. So we are kind of able to enforce state laws, but the office really frowns on it. So we have no, we have, I have never gone into traffic court to when somebody's fighting a speeding ticket, but I have had uh, a couple of cases go in the state system rather than going into the federal system. Okay, uh, and Steve, you were right. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. 
No, we were just, Kevin was saying that he's had a speeding ticket before. <laughs> <laughs> They're not fun. Um, Steve, you were right. Angelique did have another question. All right. um, has there ever been an opportunity or a situation where the wrong person was accused from searching their house? Kevin's going to answer this one. <laughs> he's, got a, he's got a good story. There, there have been situations, and, and so we don't go in assuming everybody's, you know, guilty. And, and obviously our country is set up where you're innocent until proven guilty. And that's one of the things that we do as computer forensic uh, agents is we're responsible for going through their computers. So, you know, usually that's when we figure out something's wrong here, you know, that, hey, this is supposed to be our bad guy, and we start going through their computer, and we're not finding what we were expecting to find. And we've had situations where uh, someone living next to someone was hacking their Wi-Fi. And uh, so we did, we traced the, uh, the illegal activity back to a certain house, and then when we did the search warrant, we didn't find what we were looking for, and we realized that, oh, my God, they have an open Wi-Fi and their neighbor or someone nearby is hacking into them. And we've had this in several situations. And, and in that case, the computer forensic agent is that person's best friend because our, our investigation into their computer will prove that they're innocent. And, uh, and they will never be charged for what it was we knocked on their door for originally. And hopefully we will get enough evidence uh, to, to apprehend the actual person. So we just don't assume everybody's the bad guy. We do our investigation to try and make sure that everything is, is pointing to the right person. We have been surprised when uh, the, the computer's actually clean and, uh, and it was actually someone else doing it. So that, that can happen, in which case we're your best friend. Right. Um, and Angelique also wanted to know if you've ever pulled over a car because of human trafficking. Yes, I've pulled over several cars for human trafficking. Um, I usually have, um, I, I work with, I used to work with uh, a lot of local agencies. I don't know where you guys are, are located, but um, I worked with uh, Clearwater Police Department, uh, Pinellas County Sheriff's Office, Pasco Sheriff's Office. So I have, um, I have pulled people over um, in the course of my duties uh, with them for human trafficking. Pasco East School is in Spring Hill. It's a part of Pasco County. I should have seen that with mm -hmm. Pasco at the bottom. That's a clue. I kind of missed that. <laughs> it's Friday before Thanksgiving week. Yeah. And uh, I think we'll have Kevin, you want to talk about the HERO program real quick? Yeah, I know we're running out of time, but one of the things that we want to talk about is we were, uh, we were kind of inundated with uh, cases, and there were at the time there were only two of us that were forensic agents. It was before Steve became a forensic agent in, in addition to his other duties. Uh, there was a program that was developed. There's a, a poster on the wall back here. Uh, it was, it's called the HERO program. It's called, it stands for Human Exploitation Rescue Operative, and it, it was exact, exactly designed to take uh, wounded, ill, or injured military personnel, people who are combat, wounded, combat, injured, uh, and you know, find another purpose for them uh, and give them special training and tools to help us in the, the fight against child exploitation online. Uh, so we've, we've brought in people that were wounded military uh, service members uh, that were itching to get back into doing something positive for the country. And uh, we've given them the training and taught them how to help us in this. And we actually have three of those guys now in our office here. In addition to now, Steve has gone off to the school uh, as a special agent. So now we've got plenty of people here to do this, this mission. Uh, Justin is one of our, uh, our first heroes we had here. He was a Marine and uh, in an explosion in Afghanistan, he lost both of his legs. Uh, and he has the coolest service dog you could ever imagine, Gunner. Uh, and so it's just our privilege to work with him every day. We've got Nathan, who was uh, a helicopter crew chief that was injured overseas. Uh, we've got Joe, who was injured uh, while he was in the Navy, right? Uh, so uh, we, we've got these great guys that have a great attitude, and they're, they have a, a fire in their belly where they want to put uh, bad guys away. So they really help our office and our agency uh, in, in fighting the, the – the outbreak of like child exploitation and these predators that are trying to prey on uh, on kids like you uh, on, online. So it's it's been a lot of fun working with those guys. And just uh, again, uh, we talked earlier about kind of this, this public service announcement. Um, you know, and Kevin, you know, said it. Um, 
you know, the child exploitation, when you think about child exploitation, it's kind of a broad term. Um, you may be imagining, you know, uh, a toddler or an eight-year-old. But what we're talking about, too, is, is just a juvenile, someone under 18. So that applies to probably all of you guys out there, right? Um, and, you know, uh, online safety is something uh, that especially our, our hero guys, uh, Justin, Nathan, and, and Joe, they talk a lot about. Um, but, you know, we're seeing victims uh, in your age range. And uh, really the victimization is, um, you know, uh, it, it's kind of hard to describe. It's that lack of uh, really you – you want this connection with someone online and you really don't know anything about them. Um, we've had several cases of, um, you know, young teens and even, er, uh, even younger, uh, thinking they're, they're talking to someone of their, their same age. Um, but who are they actually talking to? They're talking to a, you know, a 50 year old man, uh, someplace who's, you know, portraying himself as, uh, you know, a 14 year old boy or a 14 year old girl. Um, Richard's case that we did so we, we've had lots and lots of cases of, of this and it's, um, I, I would just want to encourage online safety for all you guys. There's a lot of resources out there on the internet. Um, the iGuardian website, uh, if you just Google I, the, sort of like iPhone, iGuardian, um, the, that's a government website uh, designed for online safety. Uh, and it'll kind of show you some things. A lot of things you don't understand, and you know I, I've had to deal with it uh, with my own children, and I've got uh, kids ten and under, um, and just them not realizing that there are people out there that uh, do not have good intentions, uh, and you know quite honestly want to hurt uh, kids, whether it be kids, uh, you know, like my age, my my kids' age, um, or even young adults like yourselves. So. Please be safe on the internet. Um, Steve, Kevin, and Bill, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to talk with us. Um, and I just want to give a plug. Um, Pasco East School has launched a criminal justice academy, and you can come out with um, industry certification um, once you take criminal justice um, operations for you can choose um, a couple of paths, and um, we're also going to be starting a cybersecurity program. So Pasco eSchool is really an innovative um, school that comes up with all kinds of opportunities. Um, and again, um, Steve, Kevin, and Bill, I really appreciate your time today. Absolutely. Our pleasure. Great. So I'm going to take us offline. Just give me one second and hang tight. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks, Brandon. Everybody have an excellent day, and thank you for joining us for Pasco eSchool's Virtual Great American Teaching. It has been an awesome Friday morning with these awesome guys, and we will see you soon.